So everyone, recently I had come across a video, my YouTube feed, a video created by Blair White featuring Patricia Paytas. And I really thought it was an interesting video. They talked about their both their struggles with eating disorders. And I made a lot of really great points. And I wanted to expand on them or respond to them um, to help anyone who may be struggling with what they're talking about or who may not understand exactly what it looks like. I wanted to just provide a little bit more clarity on that. First, welcome to my channel. Welcome back to my channel. My name is Stephanie. I'm Long Island's eating disorder specialist. I post on this channel all about eating disorders, body image issues, and general mental health. So if any of that interests you, please click the subscribe button down below. While you're at it, I would encourage you to subscribe to my email list using the link in the description below. Every week I'll send you out a newsletter letting you know what content I have coming out that week and I create resources to go along with many of my videos to help you get the most out of them. So if that is interesting to you or if you would like to receive that, definitely go ahead and subscribe there. I'm going to be starting this video about a minute in, just skipping a little bit of the intro into it, but just a little bit of an overview in case you don't know who they are. Trisha Paytas is a YouTuber influencer and Blair White is a transgender influencer who talks a lot about transgender issues and such like that. And they both have really interesting perspectives when it comes to what they have struggled with. And that's why I think it's really important to expand on this as a professional who specializes in the treatment of eating disorders podcast together Trisha and I discovered we have quite a bit in common like in all seriousness that I've never talked about before that I actually talked about for the first time on your podcast was my eating disorder mm -hmm. because I don't know I've just never felt super comfortable talking about it and calling it an eating disorder I guess like I've never when your podcast dropped on Spotify I got a bunch so I wanted to make a point there that's really interesting that she speaks of this because what it is, it's a big deal. A lot of people really struggle with calling what they're struggling with an eating disorder because when people call it an eating disorder, there's a lot of stigma that's attached to it. A lot of people believe that you have to look a certain way to have an eating disorder, you have to act a certain way to have an eating disorder, and that is very much just a narrative that's been perpetuated, which is really not the case. There's actually a lot of miseducation about eating disorders, which causes a lot of people to not actually be getting the help that they need and really recognizing what their behaviors are and exactly what it is, which is an eating disorder. Disorder. So what she's talking about is a very typical thing for someone who is struggling with an eating disorder. Also, just before I start, I have to just notice their their Gucci um, like barrettes. I think it's so cute that they have them both, and then Blair's is upside down. It's just so funny. How I have an eating disorder? Yeah. Do you talk about this? No, I've never talked about it. Usually, I starve myself a lot, so I'll go like 24 to 48 hours without mm -hmm. eating. So a lot of people don't know that bulimia is defined as um, abusing, like making yourself puke but it also can be defined by abusing like laxatives. Oh. So I really struggle with that, which is really, really like bad. Like X-lax. But it, like it's really fucked up. And I can't believe I even told you about that. I All right. This is very, very true. A lot of people really do believe about, they, what they believe about bulimia is that it's only done through methods of inducing vomiting. However, there are alternate methods to people who struggle with bulimia. And the reason why I'm saying this is not to give ideas but rather to for people who are struggling with these behaviors to recognize it as such. It is very important when we're talking about a disorder or something along those lines that we recognize it for what it is. So other methods of bulimia besides inducing vomiting is also using laxatives, about abusing laxatives as Blair has talks about, talked about. Uh, also abusing diuretics, which diuretics help for people to, well, when used correctly, help people to like urinate and such like that. But uh, obviously if you're abusing it, that's something that would be classified as bulimia, as well as compulsive over-exercising. So basically attempting to purge the food through exercise. I opened up about a few things on your podcast, which was, the first was that I alternate day fast constantly, which people say is healthy. I don't really think it is because I wake up in the morning and I almost faint. Like I'm weak. And you talked about that the too. Day, yeah. Like right now I'm like water fasting and I got a little like lightheaded. It's like one o'clock and this is like the time I'm like, okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's like a lot. And then the other thing, a lot of people think that, and by the way, thank you for everyone reaching out. and like. So I'm going to stop here again. That is something that I know that we hear a lot about intermittent fasting. And I know that some people really, really do believe that it's something that is healthy and positive. Um, so 
I'm not here to tell anyone how to live their lives. However, I am here to say that if you are struggling with an eating disorder, disordered eating, or you really have an unhealthy relationship with food, I would strongly caution you against intermittent fasting from purely the mental health end, that that could be a very dangerous and a slippery slope. And it could be really a trap to lead you into more and more severe behaviors. Not that that isn't a severe behavior in and of itself. It just becomes much more um, just a part of your life. And as they're talking about here, the physical symptoms, yeah, you could get very much lightheaded and it could be having, obviously there's a lot more physical consequences that could come from restricting and constantly fasting and such like that. But that that's just something I wanted to bring up and touch base on with regards to all that. Anemia is actually defined as not only like making yourself throw up, but it's also making yourself like taking black mm -hmm. food, abusing. Different black. between yeah. abuse and use. I'm really glad that she pointed out that there was really a difference between use and abuse because obviously laxatives have their place. And obviously if some people are struggling with going to the bathroom, that is the place that they would be using laxatives in a healthy way. Abuse is a disorder. Abuse is a behavior in bulimia. And it's crazy because, you know, we live in LA and if you go and you try to get laxatives from a lot of different places like CVS, Rite Aid, whatever, they're often sold out mm -hmm. because it's so common yeah. in this city just because a lot of people are in entertainment and they want to like look their best. I didn't realize how common it was until I did some research. That is crazy. And I, well, this is just like reason number like 3 million as to why we should not be looking at Hollywood for any sort of like life advice or any sort of just role models. And it's a real shame. And I, and I imagine that some of them struggle very greatly with the issues that are causing them to be turning to um, such things such as laxative abuse. And I have had some clients who have spent significant time um, or significant portions of their life out in LA and the California area. Um, and I have had a lot of them describe that it, it's a very, very difficult place to live, especially if you're struggling with the eating disorder or disordered eating or anything like that, or body image, because there's just such in, insane standards. And realistically, most people there have most <laughs> have a lot of plastic surgery and they don't naturally look the way that they're trying to look or trying to appear as so I am not terribly surprised really thinking about it that what Blair is saying that there's so much like sold out of laxatives in um in in LA and I think that's really 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 scary and very sad and moral of the story just don't move I there we talk about like our own experiences with eating disorders because one thing I learned from talking about it on your podcast and people messaging me about it was that people can relate to it a lot. A lot more people go through it than we think. That is true. I feel like especially like this kind of like eating disorder because I think you mm. think of eating disorders and you think of like someone like, I don't look like I have an eating disorder, obviously. That's like the joke, right? I was like, well, she obviously doesn't have an eating disorder because it's like, you know, like I'm bigger, but like I feel like you think of anorexia and anorexia only. Okay. Thank you, Trisha, for bringing this up. This is such an important topic. So one point is that People always have this idea that an eating disorder means that someone is severely underweight, they appear very underweight, they look maybe emaciated, and they also associate eating disorders with anorexia. So a couple of myths there that we need to bust is that one, any person can have an eating disorder. In fact, many, many people who have eating disorders don't actually look like they have an eating disorder. They don't look that they are severely underweight. And if you are at that point, that means that you are, have struggled for quite some time with certain behaviors. And that is very much later on in an eating disorder. So a lot of people who struggle with, and I would say the majority of people who struggle with eating disorders do not look any different than other people around them, than anyone else. So that's one point. And then also how she said that one of the things that a lot of people think of when they think of eating disorders is anorexia. And I also want to just clarify that, that it seems as though she's brid bridging the idea that anorexia also means someone is underweight or severely underweight or looks like that. Um, however, anorexia, it's very possible. There's no longer a criteria in the diagnostic and statistical manual saying that a person has to be under a certain weight in order to meet the criteria of the diagnosis of anorexia. So it is extremely possible um, and very much a thing that people who are technically considered overweight 
actually can still have the diagnosis of anorexia. So I did want to just clarify that. So again, main takeaway is that if you are struggling with any sort of disordered eating or feeling that you have an unhealthy relationship with food or with your body, don't wait until you look the part of having an eating disorder or don't try to take all the stereotypes that are out there and use that as I shouldn't get treatment or I should get treatment or whatever. If you are struggling in any way, get treatment, get help. The earlier it's caught and treated, the better. And I'm like kind of skinny, but I'm not like the typical like image of someone who is suffering from anorexia. Yeah, I mean, like I'm not like real thin, but that doesn't really determine that someone's suffering with it. Well, and there's like eating disorder and then body dysmorphia, which kind of goes like hand in hand. I feel like absolutely eating disorders yeah. have body dysmorphia because you think that you're bigger than you are. Thank you again, Trisha. That is absolutely amazing that you bring that up because body dysmorphia, if you are not aware of what body dysmorphia is, body dysmorphic disorder by definition is a person having preoccupation or extreme worry about either a slight or possibly totally imagined defect within one's own body. And you can have an eating disorder without having body dysmorphia and you can have body dysmorphia without having an eating disorder. However, most people who struggle with anorexia and bulimia and various other eating disorders also do struggle with body dysmorphia. They are very highly linked. Like I said, you don't have to have them both, but very much so if, if you meet the criteria or if you are struggling with anorexia or bulimia, a big part of that is fear of weight gain. And also while you're engaging your behaviors, it actually morphs your brain's perception, which makes it even more likely that you're seeing your body in a distorted light. So right on, that is absolutely true that they do go hand in hand. That is so true. First of all, dysmorphia is different from dysphoria, mm -hmm. which gender dysphoria is obviously what I thought when I transitioned and when right. I trans, whatever. Dysmorphia is like looking at yourself in the mirror and thinking you're fat when you're not or thinking you're skinny when you're not. In fact, I wanted to actually talk about that. And it doesn't it's have to only be weight. Oh, um, it's weight that's what Trisha just says. So the yes. other day, I was literally in the mirror before going. I went biking in Santa Monica with my friends. And before I left, I was Fun. like, I almost had a breakdown because I felt like I looked so fat. I didn't want to go out in public. I but then, like all the time. Yeah, but then Joey took a picture of me, and I almost feel like I look too skinny. When I saw the picture, I realized, like... <laughs> I love that. You're right. <laughs> I know. I'm going to show the picture. All gender. <laughs> the two genders, like toilet and disabled. Why is that the thing? That is so weird. That doesn't make any Why sense. Why genders, <laughs> toilet and disabled? They should have... Yeah. Um, <laughs> okay, sorry. But it's because... I love Trisha's laugh. It's so funny. Like you. Mm -hmm. Whereas I see in a picture that's objective. You can't lie about a picture. That's so true. So when you're looking in the mirror, a lot of times the body dysmorphia will be very, very heightened that you are seeing yourself in a very distorted, distorted light. And that doesn't mean that you can't see that yourself that way in a picture as well. You might be picking it apart very much, but I do see that a lot of my clients are able to look at a picture and be able to see things more clear. And it's especially much more prevalent after a while in recovery and perhaps weight changes have been occurring as a result of recovery in a positive direction. And when their perception is improving also with their body, as well as being able to kind of like hindsight 2020, right? That you look back at a picture, a lot of people are able to identify that their body size was not what they, it is, what they really thought it was at the time. Have you ever had a time in your life that you say like you you hated your body with everything that you had at that point in time however when you look back you just wish that you could have that body You'd be like well why was I unhappy with that this is a prime example of that because body dysmorphia won't let you be satisfied with whatever or wherever your body is at because it is distorting the image of your body so no matter what it's mental no matter how much you change your body it's not going to be good enough for you because you're struggling with body dysmorphia it's there and I'm like Wow, I'm really like messed up in the head. And what's right. crazy, like, tell me if you agree. And something someone said to me in DMs that was messaging me about it after the podcast was like, eating disorders, like, they consume you like every single day. Like, you're it's, you're never not thinking about mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. what you're gonna eat, how you're gonna avoid eating. Yes, every day. Oh my god, I plan. Yeah, every every minute, I'm just like, oh, like I can't see. Like, I'll even tell people like I can't see you because I'm fasting, or I'm can't see you because I'm on a diet. Me too. It's, and it's sad. You miss yeah. out on stuff. Yeah. Like my socializing is my eating. And that's every. That's a lot of people though. People want to That is very eating. true. When you are struggling with uh, disordered eating or an eating disorder, what a major component that makes it a disorder is that it disrupts your typical life functioning. So especially when it comes to eating disorders that we see an increase typically in social isolation. 
especially the further along you get into an eating disorder. So if you are struggling with an eating disorder, you may find that all of a sudden more likely, you're more likely to decline invitations. Meanwhile, you may have been a social person before that. You may be more unwilling to go to parties or social events because most cultures, especially the Western culture, and I feel even more so in others, um, we have a, an emphasis on food and food is a big social component or food has a big social component, almost any social gathering. I mean, I, I think I've yet to be to in, in like involved in a social gathering that didn't have um, food as a big center of it. I mean, think about it, any wedding you go to, there's a meal that's around, it, that, that everything's arranged around. Like, it's just a big deal. It's a big part of our culture. So that's why a lot of people who are struggling with eating disorders will withdraw from social events. And obviously that has consequences as it pertains to social relationships. So I have to like, literally this week, I mean, could tell you, like I literally was like, I can't see you girls for like seven days. Cause like one, I'm like grumpy. I'm like, I'm like fainted. I'm like light energy, all that stuff. Cause, Cause like, you're currently fasting. Yeah, I'm currently fasting. So you're speaking like my literal mm -hmm. exact same situation. It's stopping again. Very true. All these things do come from restricting. You are not yourself. And there's a high likelihood that you are more irritable and that you don't feel good. I mean, it's kind of like, where do you think the word, the term hangry was coined? I mean, if you are not, if you're hungry just regularly and that could lead, really lead to being grumpy and irritable. So I'm not surprised when she's talking about this. I'm like, are we going to have this forever? Do we seek help? Yeah. Because the thing I've learned is that you have just through research and like therapy is that you have an eating disorder of voice. So the eating disorder of voice will tell you there's always like a new goal. Like, doesn't matter how much you lose, no matter how you look, there's always a new goal. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh, I just love this video so much. I think it's amazing that they're bringing awareness to this. Very true. So one of the cornerstones I would tell you about treatment when it comes to an eating disorder, one of the very, very first things that I talk about with my clients, either in the intake or the first session, is discerning that there's an eating disorder voice and a healthy self voice. And that doesn't mean that you have voices in your head. That's not what it's talking about. And I know a lot of people get a little weirded about that at first. However, when we talk about the eating disorder versus a healthy voice, and I've done a whole video about this, our healthy self is a part of you that's wanting to get help, the part of you that's probably watching this video to get more understanding about it. And the eating disorder is the thing that wants to keep you sick. The eating disorder has its own motivation. So an example of how it might play out is that you have your eating disorder, let's say you wake up and you, someone's making pancakes and your eating disorder says, well, that's nice, but you're not having any. And then your healthy self says, well, it's, I need to eat something for breakfast. Like that's not healthy to start my day off without eating anything. And your eating disorder is like, well, I don't really care because you're not having pancakes. That's just so much carbs or it's just a horrible day to start the day. You don't have to eat right now. And then your healthy self responds to that. It says, well, it's really going to give me a, a good source of energy to start my day with. And it just goes back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And we need to be able to identify which is a healthy voice and which is an eating disorder voice. And sometimes they can be really entangled um, and so that's a big part of the work is to be able to identify, okay, when you're feeling this way, is that really your healthy self or could it be your eating disorder trying to justify um, this behavior for you? And also like, it'll just always be there unless you get help. But part of not getting help is the eating disorder telling you if you get help, you're going to get fat. So right, true. I get that. But I know I have one. I know I've because I've always been like this since a kid. Like since eight years old. I would not eat Monday through Friday. My sister would tell you, like, I would not eat Monday through Friday and then once Friday night hits, I'd start binging till Sunday night. See, that's really bad. Yeah. And I I've very about unhealthy. Things, like if you think of your weight and eating mm -hmm. patterns more than like twice a day, you have an eating disorder. Yeah. So it's like definitely me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So absolutely. If you are struggling with thoughts about food and your body and it's consuming a lot of your thoughts that is a really big indication that something is up and i would say that probably most people would meet this criteria and perhaps it's not necessarily at the point that it's an eating disorder which is why it's important to recognize that there's a lot of disordered eating and i would really argue that a lot of our population is inundated with people who have a disordered relationship with food and with their bodies. Um, so maybe I wouldn't go so far as to saying that that's an eating disorder because I think that that's a very big part of the culture. Not saying it's right, but I don't want to say that the entire culture and everyone in the culture has an eating disorder, but it really is an indication that something needs to be worked on. And I would say that if you are 
thinking about food or body image multiple times a day that it does warrant getting help even if you're not necessarily at the point of feeling like it should be classified as an eating disorder allow a professional to make that um diagnosis for you do you exercise no and no. i used to i used to dance all the time but i had a knee injury like last year so i haven't exercised since then because oh. that's that's part of my disorder as well as i'm like kind of addicted to exercise oh like what one of the yeah one of the things that i do Oh my god, it's that. like on Saturdays, which you should be like, if anything, letting loose on Saturdays, right? It's not whatever. Is I'll do like a crazy fitness day where like I don't eat, that's the biggest thing, do not eat one thing, and then work out for an hour cardio in my gym in my apartment building, and then do running canyon, and then do weights at LA Fitness just all day because then I feel like I'm so far negative in the calories, and that's how sick I am in my mind about it. And it really does consume me. That is very, very sick. I mean, that is very dangerous, and please don't ever do something like this, especially first off that is just way too much exercise in a day for any person um, that's putting a lot of strain in your heart and all of that but especially without eating that is a very very dangerous thing you can be exercising and get very lightheaded and then you're putting yourself in a compromised position and let's say you're lifting weights but you haven't eaten all day you can really really get hurt and sustain injury um, just because you're doing that so really really I would caution you against doing any of that and it's really important I would talk to your nutritionist about this but especially not that you should be doing any sort of exercise like this intense and crazy fitness days or anything like that and Blair even points out that it's very sick because it's just something that you need to have food if you're going to exercise I mean that's food is calories and calories are sources of energy and that's important for you to actually be able to use for when you are exercising or moving your body a single day and it's so crazy to talk about this out loud because I've never talked about really? this. Really? No. I feel like it's all I've talked about because I like, <laughs> I like, it consumes me all the time. Yeah. And it's about looks for you, right? Yeah, it's me about too. looks. What's crazy is like, obviously I transitioned because I was uncomfortable with my body. And transitioning like helped a lot, like in terms of like, my dysphoria went away. But what got replaced with it, or what replaced it rather, was like this dysmorphia and this eating disorder because it's like, okay, you know, I always wanted to go through life being perceived as a woman and then you get there and you're like, okay, now it's about being like attractive. It's different than just transitioning, if that makes sense. As I talked about before, uh, Blair is a transgender and it's really going to be something important that I'm going to talk about more that transgenders actually are people who are highly affected by eating disorders. It's a community uh, of people that tend to have a higher likelihood of developing eating disorders than other facets of the of our culture. Um, and it's really, really important to talk about. And if you want me to talk more about it, I do think I'm going to be posting a video shortly about um, about this and about there's uh, the research and about how they are impacted in a different way um, but let me know if it is something that you're interested in learning more about um, I think it's really really important that Blair is talking about this because um, it is really a problem that the transgender community faces at higher rates. Well I feel like that does make sense because I feel like now what you're talking about because that's exactly how I feel is I go to food therapy about this and stuff like that is like it's like a mental illness for real because like for me I'm like if I'm skinny I'll be fine and then my therapist is like I promise you like that is not your answer like yeah. you're, you're gonna lose weight but you're still not mm -hmm. gonna be happy that's a hundred percent true a lot of people this is why eating disorders you'll never be happy body image is mental so you will never ever be happy you may have had bouts where you're like oh yeah I'm happy I'm good but what happens is that you'll always set a new goal let's say I'll be happy when I hit x amount of weight and then all of a sudden you hit that weight it's like not as grand as you would have thought so it's like okay I'll be happy when I hit this amount of weight and lower and lower and lower and what happens is that you're not happier in fact you usually get worse and worse and worse and I heard a lot of people describe that they were the most unhappy at their lowest weight I promise you, this is something I can say with a 100% guarantee that losing weight is not going to change your life in the way that you think. It is not going to all of a sudden make all your problems go away, make everything so much easier to deal with, make all the problems that you do have easier to get through. It's not. It's a facet of our culture that we're obsessed with and this idea that this is going to make everything better and that thin means like everything is just easier and better. That's just not true. It's a lie and it's something that we really need to be confronting like, as a culture about this. by the fact that we do social media and I feel like whenever you gain or lose a pound, your comment section is going to be about like whether you gained or lost a That's pound. awful. Well, have you talked about that like after your surgery? How all the comments were just like, oh, Blair gained. Like, oh, yeah. 
Yeah, so this all started for me in 2017 after I got my face and my boobs done. And I couldn't work out because you can't jump around with like new breasts and they were new, new for me. I went from like a wall to like double D's. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> I don't know, I'm like, I don't want to see. I was like, wait, how big are they? It's fine. It's okay. Um, <laughs> but I couldn't work out and then I gained a bunch of weight and then I did an interview because like sometimes you film videos and you're like, you got your angles right yeah. and you got your lighting right yeah. and you're like, doesn't matter if you gain weight because you can't tell. Right. But I did an interview where it was like 4K, full, every crazy angle, multiple cam like multiple cameras and everyone was in the comments were like, Blair's getting thick. And I was so skin skinny in like my whole life that that was like a new concept to me. Right. I was like, now I'm I don't understand why people feel the need to comment on all that type of stuff. So your whole life you've been able to maintain your weight by... You don't know what person's struggling with. I never with. even tried. I used to literally eat like every day of my life oh. but it was because when i was like a boy it was like the hormones like cut me thin i feel like but estrogen made me gain a lot of weight and estrogen scientifically it makes you like hold good point weight. when women are meant to be heavier than men in the sense of we have more fat we are meant to have more fat stores um so men's bodies that's why men tend to be leaner and they have an easier time losing weight and such like that um, because they are not needing as much fat stores as women do. So it's actually a pretty interesting point and a point that she's able to make considering that the hormones were different and she did go through that transition. Because like, okay, here's the thing and like, oh, this is gonna sound so bad, but Just in my head, yeah. like when I water fast, like, okay, the first day, brutal. Second day, oh my God, I'm gonna die. Third, once you get past the third day, it, it feels like, amazing. And you're just like, whoa, like it feels really like focused. I feel really energetic. It was really weird. So like when I did the water fast and I went past the third day, I felt so much more energy. And it was almost like I didn't want to stop. The only thing that made me stop, which then again, here it goes, is this an eating disorder. That's very eating disorder too. When you get through, it's like, it's like a goal that you just got through. And it's like, oh yeah, I could do this. And there will be a high when it comes to that type of restriction in terms of an eating disorder. So I'm not going to totally write that off. Is it going to be a good high? No, just like drugs is not going to give you a good high where it's a positive thing for you. It's very dangerous and it's not something that's sustainable and it's a, it's a poor or a bad high to chase. So I would really highly advise you not to be trying this. And my heart was getting really jittery. And so I was like, let me just like have a little banana or something. And so like I decided then, to like break the fast. It's very dangerous because when it comes to eating disorders, especially anorexia and bulimia, it really could tax the heart. And there are very, very dangerous issues. It can lead to bradycardia, which is a slowed heart rate. It could lead to irregular heartbeats. It can even lead to heart that. failure. Yeah, well, that's the thing. And then you start feeling guilty about eating. And it's like, why would you feel guilty about eating? It's like what you have mm -hmm. to do and to I stay always alive. Do. Even now when like I eat, I feel guilty. I was like, oh, that was like a splurge. Even if it's not, even, well, but also I don't like healthy food, so. All right, one of the things I wanna point out, and this is gonna go a little bit into another part of it, is that when she talks about healthy foods, so something that I would really recommend for anyone struggling with an eating disorder is that healthy foods and unhealthy foods, I really would encourage you to stay away from those labels because it really just starts to put so much power into the food. Everything, it's good or bad, and it's such black or white, and that's not really the case. We can absolutely understand that there are foods that are more nutritious versus less nutritious. However, it's something that we really need to put in perspective that we can't just totally write off a food group because that's gonna make you absolutely miserable. Bad. We need to get help, I feel like. Are you? I feel like I should. I mean, I feel like if something's consuming your mind every day and it's not allowing you to like go out in the world and be successful and have friends and have fun. So I would like to be able to get rid of that aspect, like be able to just live my life Yeah. without thinking like, this is an eating day, so I can't live my life I wonder today. what that is though, because it's a mental, that's mental. Oh yeah, like I said, I mean, the fact that I looked to myself yeah. fat in the mirror that day, then I looked at the picture, I was like, ew, I look almost sickly. It's almost like a drug we need or something that like fix the company. So like, one of the things that I would really, really recommend and she brings up in this video is getting help. If you are struggling with any sort of disordered eating, any sort of unhealthy relationship with your body, with eating, with food, whatever it is, I would highly, highly encourage you to get help. And one of the most important parts of this is to make sure you're getting help from the right person. There's a million therapists and professionals and not everyone is created equal for one. And for two, 
almost every single person says that they treat eating disorders. And I would really, really, really caution you because what a lot of people don't know, even in the mental health world, which is one of the reasons that it, there's just so much misunderstanding around eating disorders is that there's not a lot of education around it, even in the mental health world. So a lot of people just don't think, or a lot of professionals don't even realize that it does require a specialty. specialty. It does require a lot of research. It does require a lot of training and all of that and experience when it comes to treating eating disorder. So if you are struggling at all, make sure that you find help from an eating disorder therapist. So I do have a video on it. If you have any questions, you can let me know. If you're interested in working with me, absolutely reach out to me. Uh, I do do virtual sessions. So that is something that is available if you are really looking to get help for your eating disorder. So you know what I think? I think this would an addict too because like I consider myself an addict I've like pills and stuff I think once you're an addict you're always an addict and I think that's the same way for I mean that's like that's what they tell you in like AA meetings it's like once you're an addict you're an addict for life like you're yeah. a recovering addict or whatever but like you're always an addict and I think that's like eating disorders I think once you have an eating disorder you have it for life even if you get help for one it. of the things I want to point out about that is that she's right there's a lot of similarities when it comes to addiction and eating disorders however something that I would argue is that you don't have to have an eating disorder for life and I do here's a big difference between drug addiction and eating disorders is that meanwhile there might be an addiction to a behavior or such like that the thing is you can absolutely live the rest of your life without ever touching drugs again so therefore abstinence is typically a way to go for um, recovery from drug addiction however for an eating disorder, abstinence is not possible because abstinence is an eating disorder, but abstinence from food, you have to eat food. So we don't have the same type of treatment available for eating disorders or the same type of treatment isn't appropriate for eating disorders versus addiction for drug uh, substance use. So when she says that she feels as though there's a person who is struggling with an eating disorder has it for life, I would argue that that's not the case. I do believe that full recovery is possible and full recovery may look different from person to person. And what I would say is that we also have to recognize that eating disorders typically are a big part of your life at some point in time, whether it's for a couple months or longer. So you may go on in the future and that eating disorder voice may pop out, a pop up now and again, it might be but a whisper. And just as easy as it came, it's as easy as it goes. And that might be what recovery looks like for you. It's, I think it's an addiction. Like mm -hmm. the fact that we just go through constant cycles of not eating and then binging and then like for yeah. me laxatives, which is so fun. It's like, that's an addiction because especially if there's pills involved, like for me, it's like, yeah, I like hide the pills from my fiance because he like tries to tell me what he's like. There's so many people wanting to have an affair. Mm. There's so many things. So me I don't know, like I, transitioning, drugs, yes, anorexia. All right, so I'm going to stop this video here because I think that that's really the meat of it. But I really do hope that I brought some more clarity and awareness around eating disorders. I am so grateful for Blair White and Trisha Paytas for making this video because it really brings up a lot of great topics. And one of the things I'm super, super grateful for is that they actually talk about real things. There's a huge problem is that people who do talk about eating disorders, so often I see that they're just missing the mark and they are making statements that are very unhealthy or very dangerous. And on the other hand, there's a lot of people who claim that they're in recovery and recovery isn't necessarily um, really what they're going through. They're kind of doing like a pseudo recovery because they might transition from one eating disorder more to another eating disorder, which is also very dangerous if you're looking for role models who can help you through recovery. I'm not saying all, but it's very, very important to be very mindful of who you're following online with regards to educating yourself more about eating disorders or just becoming, being able to learn more about what you are going through if you're struggling. I hope that you enjoyed this video. I hope that this was something that brought a little bit more clarity. Let me know what you think. If you thought anything or had any questions about eating disorders or about what maybe Blair or Trisha were talking about, I'd be more than happy to answer from my perspective as an eating disorder therapist. Of course, if you're interested in working with me, you can absolutely reach out to me. You can click my face to subscribe to my channel if you're interested in learning more about eating disorders, body image issues, or general mental health. And I wish you wellness on your journey to finding your state of balance. And I will see you in my next video.